So I'm going to talk today about combining technologies for food decontamination, extending the shelf life of fruits and vegetables in particular. Can I ask, how, how many people were at last year's conference? Okay, not many, just, just a few. Okay. Um, so uh, this work um, was funded by the European Union, um, uh, um, and what we were looking at was a combination of emerging processes, and the whole fundamental ethos behind this work was to try and look at minimizing uh, surface damage uh, to food produce, and we were hoping to achieve that by combining different technologies and achieving um, a lethal exposure in each case sufficient to kill any pathogens, uh, but insufficient to create any surface damage to the produce. So I'll give you a brief introduction. What, one of the main um, areas of technology that we were looking at here was for uh, lasers. And oh, the, may, maybe I should say, if anyone's arrived late, I'm giving this talk because um, Chris couldn't make this, unfortunately, so that, I'm stepping in. Uh, there seemed to be a bit of confusion there, so I'm actually not Chris. Um, maybe I should, int should have introduced myself. I'm Ian Watson from Glasgow University, and I'm, I'm s literally standing in at the last minute here. So uh, um, hopefully that's not a problem for you. So and hopefully you're interested in this. Otherwise, you can go and get a coffee, I'm sure. And okay, so that's where we are today at the moment. Um, so we were looking at... at laser technology in particular, and combining that with other processes. Now, la lasers have their, their niche application here. Um, one of the disadvantages are p potentially quite expensive uh, for some food processing applications, but um, may be advantageous in other areas. So I'll give you an idea of lasers, what they can do, um, and sort of some of the environmental parameters that are associated with that laser processing. Um, some of the general materials and methods, so I won't spend too long on that. We're already a little bit behind time. Um, and the impact of using different lasers and then combining those lasers as well. So the background to this was the, the, the need for safe um, food and also trying to provide food with, with a reasonable shelf life. And there's been massive adva advances in this in recent times. Um, and with food poisoning, it, it's still a massive problem in the USA alone. There's about $152 billion per annum cost. Um, probably about a tenth of that in the, in the UK. Um, there's about 5,000 deaths in the US um, every year as well, attributed to food poisoning. And in terms of shelf life uh, waste, up to about 2 billion tons of food are wasted per year. So there's opportunities there of using that food, for, for that food waste for lots of different avenues. Anaerobic digestion, for example, that's taking off significantly in the UK now. We're probably behind some of Europe. Uh, but there's, there's about 100 AD plants at the moment. Um, so in terms of the solutions, uh, we were looking at combining these different technologies to, to achieve uh, decontamination and also to extend the shelf life. So that's a schematic of a laser. I'm not sure if you can see that. I'll skip, skip over that fairly quickly. Um, these are some of the advances uh, or, or some of the things we're looking at with lasers. So one area is laser asteroid deflection, for example, which obviously is not relevant to today's topic. Uh, laser combustion, laser cleaning, um, and those types of processes. So these are the environmental parameters, most of which we've looked at for uh, using lasers for decontamination of food products um, or, or food surfaces or air relating to um, those areas. So we have the, the parameters associated with the laser, the parameters associated with the ambient conditions, so the pH, water activity, salt, temperature, sterility assurance you actually need. Um, with the laser, you might have a continuous wave laser where it's on all the time, or it might be pulsed. Uh, the polarization may play a role, and also the wavelength does play a fun fundamental role in its efficacy in terms of killing microorganisms. So if you've got a UV laser, you're going to have a different mechanism of inactivation compared to an infra infrared laser. And then you have everything related to the type of microorganism you're looking at, whether it's fungal, spores, um, or, or bacterial, or even virus. So our general method was fairly simple. Uh, we produce an overnight culture, then inoculate that onto the medium, and then treat that um, sample, and then um, uh, look at uh, growing up overnight any uh, bacteria that may be remaining, and then 
measure and, and do sort of various counting procedures on that. So um, a fairly simple process. Um, I have got a talk on Wednesday um, on looking at the real-time detection of bacteria, um, which sort of spun out from a lot of this work. Um, where we were uh, trying to speed up these, these protocols. Um, so some of that, those real-time detection techniques where we're looking, say, laser speckle or fluorescence, I'll be talking about on, on Wednesday. Um, so as an example, here's some laser treatment of the uh, agar surface. Um, you can see you get these areas of cleaning, uh, clearing, sorry, so you, you can quantify that. Um, it, it's fairly useful as a, as a rapid assessment of the e efficacy of a particular treatment. Um, so it doesn't provide you accounts, obviously, but it does provide you with an area of an activation uh, that at least allows some measure of quantifying what the impact of that, of that treatment will be. And there's a close-up there. So there, for example, uh, we are treating this with um, an eczema laser, so it's out at 248 nanometers, krypton fluoride laser, and you can see that the beam is sufficient to actually cause damage uh, to the Petri dish, um, and also it caused some killing here. Now with the same type of pulse length with a ND YAG laser operating at 1.06 microns in the thermal part of the spectrum, um, we saw similar damage to the Petri dish, but no damage to the microorganisms, which would indicate it's more of a thermal effect that's occurring. And those short transient pulses of nanoseconds in the thermal, thermal regime were insufficient to cause inactivation of the microorganism. And here we're looking at an anthrax simulant um, uh, Bacillus atrophius, um, also called Bacillus globigy, but it's changed names now, I believe. Um, and you can see the effect of changing some of the laser parameters, the treatment time and the P PRF, the pulse repetition frequency, how quickly you're pulsing the laser. So here we can see the effect of wavelength uh, with different lasers. So we've got an ND AG laser, 1.06 microns, um, and also a tripled ND AG laser, so it's about 350 odd. Uh, nanometers, an argon ion laser, and also a fire infrared laser. So we covered an enormous range of wavelengths here to assess what the impact of those lasers would be. And basically, uh, the shorter the time, no laser pointer, maybe, no, oh. So the shorter the time and the higher this fractional area is sterilized, uh, then the more efficient that, pro that process is. So the CO2 lasers at 10.6 microns gave very efficient killing. Uh, but that doesn't give the complete story, and more of that in a second. So we also had a look at the effect of organism uh, with different types of lasers, so looked at a variety of different types here. Um, this experiment looked at the effect of nd -YAG laser radiation, so it's 1.06 microns, just uh, outside the visible, and we're looking at uh, E. coli in a saline solution. And what was interesting, it seemed, it seemed to give a, a similar blebbing effect as we see here, uh, compared to penicillin, for example, where you get that effect on the E. coli cell. So there's, there's some breaking of that cell wall matrix that's occurring with this process and allowing intracellular material to leak from, from the cell if you provide a high enough exposure. So you get complete lysis of the cell. Um, but if you contrasted uh, sort of treatments with the nd laser with the water bath treatment as we did here, there was no effect with the water bath treatment for a comparable temperature uh, that was induced with the lasers. So it seems apparent that there's other effects occurring. <coughs> Excuse me. So we had a look at the effect of different substrates. Um, here we got a ND AG laser, so 1.06 microns. Um, and we're looking at the recovery accounts from glass, nylon, and stainless steel. So we'd inoculate those samples, treat it with a laser, um, and then recover those counts, grow them up um, overnight. And we were looking at nylon, stainless steel, and glass. So what is apparent here with this ND AG laser, uh, we got very efficient inactivation of the surface uh, with stainless steel, uh, whereas it wasn't quite so effective with nylon and glass. Um, in contrast to that, if we look at the effect of a CO2 laser at 10.6 microns, uh, we can see fairly uh, rapid inactivation um, uh, with, the, with the glass and the nylon, which are basically insulating materials, where, whereas with the stainless steel, um, it's much harder to kill with a CO2 laser. So what is apparent is there's a, there's a wavelength effect here going on depending upon the substrate material that you're exposing um, or the, the substrate material on which you have the organism. <coughs> so um, there's also that wavelength dependency. So with the longer infrared uh, wavelength at 10.6 microns, you're much more able to decontaminate and activate surfaces uh, they're essentially insulators, whereas with uh, 1.06 microns, 
it was more effective on conducting materials. Uh, so we developed some various laser scanning systems. So we had a look at um, rotating the beam directly coming out from the laser. Um, so we scanned that across the surface and we could scan very quickly um, with this technique. Uh, this one was a bit smaller. We just had a small 12 watt laser here. And here we had a sort of kilowatt device. And we looked at the rate of inactivation um, on an agar surface, no, sorry, collagen surface, uh, so like a sausage skin. Um, and we had uh, extremely high uh, rates of inactivation. We also looked on agar surfaces as well and a few food uh, surfaces as well. So here we can see the, see the agar surface on the left, obviously, and bottom right, we had some bacon that we covered with stratium arcesum, so we can actually see the area of clearing uh, with the treatment of the laser. So if you look at these areas of clearing here, uh, we've got a rate of inactivation. Oh, I wondered what was going on there. <laughs> it's always good to get children coming in and start early. Um, so the rate of inactivation was about 150 centimeters squared per second, so it, it's a pretty, pretty high rate there. Um, and that dependency depends upon the velocity, which we can see in this top left-hand uh, image here. So here we were, were scanning too fast, or the power was too low. Um, and you can see there's incomplete clearing of that area. Whereas um, on the right-hand side here, we're, we're scanning at an appropriate velocity uh, to actually inactivate uh, organisms on that, on that plate. Um, so we then looked, began to look at combining systems. Um, so here we, we have some work where we're looking at combining systems to extend the shelf life of carrots and potatoes in particular. I'm not sure why we picked carrots and potatoes. It's probably because we had companies working in that area, I guess. But in, we have looked at a range of other produce as well. Um, so the carrots, they were interested in the shelf life extension. And the potato producers were worried or concerned about the possibility of cross-contamination um, from soil, for example, or onto their product and that reaching the consumer um, and then obviously impacting confidence for the consumer. <coughs> so we, we had a look at a fairly, fairly complex system. We had ultrasonics here. Uh, this was the laser system. Um, and we had um, sort of a UV cage on a conventional roller. Um, and we were looking at combining those different processes. Uh, we, built, we built a pulse light system as well so we could um, look at the effect of radiating with air, and you can see a UV and pulse light system um, on the roller table installed here. So we narrowed that just for convenience, really, more than anything. So this was the effect of the pulse light system on, on these serious spores. Um, and again, you can have different types of reflectors, depending upon uh, how you want to distribute that light energy and how you want to combine that with other processes. So it becomes quite a complicated experimental task to try and optimize the, the system is because you have so many different windows where you can combine these processes um, and it's hard to map exactly what's happening um, against all those possible variables. <coughs> so we ended up um, trying to identify the type of exposure that we would want where we weren't damaging the substrate material and then uh, look at the, the effect of combining those different processes and treatments with each other. So here, for example, we got a UV treatment. So we had a 210 watt source, um, 254 nanometers. Uh, we had to allow the lamps to warm up and stabilize. And we had an irradiated area, and we knew how fast the product was passing through that. So we could work out roughly what the exposure was from that UV light. We knew how rapidly the carrots were or potatoes were rotating, for example. Uh, the laser treatment was a bit more difficult um, in terms of how we achieved that. Um, we had sort of, again, various rotation systems, a stationary beam, or we could move the beam. So there's various ways we could, we could implement the laser treatment. Um, but ultimately, what we found was you didn't need the laser in this particular case. And some of the other treatments were sufficient to provide the extension of shelf life and actually uh, control of potential pathogens to satisfy um, the carrot and potato producer. <coughs> we also had a microwave system as well and um, a hydrogen peroxide treatment. So we had various um, methods of combining these, and there's just a few selected results here. So you can see the control at the top left there, hopefully, that's after 10 days. Um, the control underneath there is after 18 days, pretty black, I don't think anyone would really want to eat those carrots. 
um, and the hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, treatment after 10 days and after 18 days. So we had a look at the uh, percentage mold, and then we could look at various regions on there, um, extrapolate these curves back, and end up with uh, a measure of the shelf life. <coughs> so if we did that, we had um, sort of an early phase decay and a late phase decay, and we could contrast that with a different treatment. So um, the, the lower the number here, the, the better the percentage per day. So the laser was, was actually very effective um, at retarding any, any decay of the produce. Um, but in some cases, it, it did turn some of the produce, and, a, and I'm not necessarily an unsightly color, but something that the consumer would probably be concerned about. So there may be some coloration problems uh, which would be an issue. <coughs> so here you can see, for example, the treatment on potatoes um, and the darkening of the skin, um, even with, with a fairly low treatment after, say, four seconds and, and 10 days. So um, we combined these systems. We had a look at these uh, microorganisms as well, and we did more detailed work on the actual combination of these processes, uh, more specific it, it, um, than on the carrots and potatoes. Uh, so we were looking here at determining optimal treatment and whether the individual treatments we investigated actually had any um, impact if, if we changed the order of treatment, for example, um, and or if we did them sequentially or together. Um, and again, just presenting a snapshot of some of those uh, results. So here we can see um, the combined inactivation system. So the three lines on the left here, we've got laser, uh, conventional heating, uh, UV, and then the sum of those three treatments. And then these other graphs, these other uh, bar um, lines here, uh, represent the combination of different processes, uh, but in different orders. So we see that there is an apparent difference between the order of treatment. Um, so this one here, um, uh, the, well, the, the, the treatment order is important. We see that the laser heat and UV was more effective than heat, UV, and laser. So this probably gives an idea of some of the mechanisms behind this process and whether you can disrupt the, the bacteria in a particular way and then use a, another additional treatment after you've weakened it in a particular way to, to look at inactivating it um, so you, they're not able to go on to grow. So in conclusion, fairly brief, but um, hopefully gave you an idea of some of the things that we've been looking at. Um, if you're using a CO2 laser, then the most uh, efficient order in terms of the substrate material would be nylon glass and stainless steel. So CO2 is quite good on, um, uh, semi, um, on um, insulating material followed by conducting material, whereas we see the reverse for NDAG at 1.06 micron, uh, where we have stainless steel substrates being able to uh, be processed much more efficiently than, say, glass or nylon. And this is going to be due to the differences in the material at 1.06 and 10.6 microns. So with the laser uh, and carrot treatments, um, the shelf life was extended. Uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide was very efficient at 9.1. Um, and laser next, followed by microwave and UV. Um, but again, as mentioned, the, the, the induced color change by the laser um, is, is unacceptable to consumers. Um, one thing I didn't mention there, um, that we measured the beta carotene and the vitamin C and there was no difference, and possibly there was even some improvement, but we didn't ass assess that in, in detail. But that possibly ties in with the previous speaker uh, talking about the effect of ultrasound improving some of the positive characteristics, um, and we saw some of that as well in terms of beta carotene and vitamin C. Um, one thing, again, not mentioned, but with, with some of the carrot treatments, um, particularly with the UV exposure, there was some induced uh, growth in the carrot, so they started to shoot much earlier than the control samples, which again may have applications for um, uh, sort of heart, uh, growers of, um, of fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, and importantly, uh, we weren't particularly damaging the substrate. There was no apparent change in, in the texture um, or the surface, apart from this color change that we saw with the carrots. Uh, with the potatoes and, and carrots, actually, with the laser treatment. Uh, so that was important. That was really what we were trying to achieve, a significant um, reduction in uh, the bacterial loading, um, but also uh, no damage to the substrate. And finally, then, the treatment order um, is important, um, and we saw that the laser 
first, followed by heat and then UV, uh, was much more effective than, say, heat, UV, and laser. So the combination and how you combine these different treatments how it plays a big role in, first of all, the, the bacterial inactivation um, and, and then consequently the, the impact on the shelf life of any food that you may be treating. And I haven't actually introduced any real-time systems. I'll be talking about that on Wednesday. Thank you very much. I see the chair has left, so I will chair my, um, my questions then. question about the single system. You show that uh, the killing rate from single system, but some of the bacteria is not die just to be injured. Did you uh, evaluate the, the rate of uh, repair damage and for these cells to become viable after the treatment? Um, not, not in every case, because that, that's obviously a lot of work, but we, we did look at specific areas and specific treatments, and um, particularly with the laser treatment, that there was no recovery whatsoever. So if we saw some apparent death, then there was death there and, and there was no recovery. Um, we, we have done quite a lot of work. Um, if I can go back to one of the original slides. Um, on this type of activity and looking at wh what's going on around the periphery region here, where you probably have a sublethal damage um, to the actual cell. And we, we were able to obviously you know, culture some of those and grow them again, but we've taken samples from the cleared zones, incubated them for a long time, and tried to find growth, and there's no apparent growth. Did you, did you notice if you sub lethal damage when you have damage when you have a combination? Not from memory, no. Um, again, again it w we were looking for, w I suppose we weren't looking on that edge, we were trying to have a combination of treatments that, that gave the combined killing. Um, so we might have a log reduction, say, for each treatment, and then look at the combined effect of those treatments to see if it was greater than the sum of the individual treatments alone. Um, so we weren't that interested in, in the periphery, sort of pre-killing pre stage. I, I'm interested in the laser treatment on carrots. Uh, from the work I have seen, the hydrogen peroxide gave the high, the longest uh, shelf life. Were you able to look at the nutrients in the carrot after the laser treatment to be able to say that the increase in shelf life using hydrogen peroxide also was able to enhance the nutrients? Uh, we didn't look at nutrients per se. Uh, all, all we really looked at there was the vitamin C content and the beta carotene content. So the vitamin C was in the potatoes and the beta carotene uh, was in the carrots. So those are the only treatments we did. Um, and as, as I briefly mentioned, uh, we th there was no difference. It certainly wasn't a negative difference. If anything, it could have been a slightly positive difference. So that's all the information I have on the front. Okay. Um, Thank you.